Uh, thank you, Ben, for leading us in music. You guys don't know how difficult it is sometimes to pull out some of these Christmas songs. And uh, it's like, it's been a year since we've done that. Yeah, it feels like a year since we've done that. And uh, thank you, Greg and Michelle, for reading and all the people that uh, have shown up tonight. It's good to see you. Merry Christmas. Um, just a couple of things. You have a program in front of you. Uh, the text of Luke is what we're going to talk through for a few moments. Uh, we have a hard stop uh, time of 7 p.m. tonight, so I've got you till then. So uh, hopefully I'll have you in rapt attention as I share with you the promises of Christmas. So you may want to follow along the text in your program. If not, we're going to have it up here for you. Also in your program, and uh, as a good pastor always does, lets people know that if you have a, a gift to give tonight, uh, tithe or offering, uh, there's an envelope provided for you. Yay! Um, you can do that and drop it in the mailbox on your way out the door tonight. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for helping us finish the year uh, uh, really, really financially strong. We're doing a lot, uh, not only in among um, the community, but around the world for, uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you for being a part of that. Has anyone ever had a secret Santa before? Raise your hand. Secret Santa. So imagine this week, uh, a young girl got a, a message that she has a secret Santa and found out that her secret Santa was Bill Gates. Now you're thinking to yourself, what would Bill Gates give somebody as a secret Santa? Well, the girl had asked that, she, uh, that whoever her secret Santa was, that they would donate to her charity. She had a mother who passed away. And so uh, once you found out Bill Gates was her secret Santa, he gave away millions of dollars to this charity. But he didn't want to leave her without something, and so she actually has a YouTube video this week, 10 minutes of unpacking all the presents Bill Gates gave her, uh, from huge Lego sets to boxes of Oreo cookies to you name it. But can you just imagine the wealth and the amount of resources at his disposal to shower upon you? And I'm thinking to myself, a secret Santa. Now, uh, don't, don't call me blasphemous. Uh, don't think I'm sacrilegious. But I think the greatest secret Santa is God. Some of you may think of him as a secret Santa because you seem like you never see him. Mm -hmm. Feels like he's not here. And the Bible tells us that he is here and he is present. That in him we live and move and have our being. And yet... To not just keep us guessing, there was a point in human history where he thought he'd make himself known to us. And that's why Jesus is so important. Because Jesus comes on the scene and says, if you want to see God, here I am. If you want to hear God, listen to me. If you want to know what the will of God is or what God thinks, just pay attention to my teachings. And that's why we're here tonight. That we have a God who is willing to lavish upon, the, upon us gifts, riches, blessings. But, but gifts and riches and blessings really are empty and fruitless and shallow if they're divorced from relationship. I don't know about you, but you may have grown up in a home where mom and dad were there, but it doesn't seem like they were present. They gave you everything you needed, right? Closing your back, roof over your head, uh, maybe a car to drive. And, and boy, they had the Christmas tree loaded with gifts for you. But even all that stuff was never a substitute for the relationship you long to have with somebody, the giver of those good gifts. Well, I'm here to encourage us tonight and to remind us that there's a God who says to us, I would never want to give you all the riches and all the blessings in the world if I first didn't give you myself. That relationship with God is the most important, most satisfying, most joyous thing you can ever experience. And I don't want you to go, go through another holiday season, another Christmas celebration, forgetful, remiss, in thinking about what is ultimately important. And that's why I want to share a song with you by a man by the name of Zechariah who doubted God, who was a man of unbelief. And, and when God finally got a hold of his heart and his mind, he erupts into a song that I want to unpack for you tonight. And there's really four things I want to, I want to touch on. And these are really promises of God, the promises of Christmas, not just for Zechariah, but for you and I. 
The first is this, the plan of salvation. What you need to know is what Zechariah sings here. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He speaks as if it's already happened because that's what the promises of God are. They're things that are secure, who are, that are steadfast, that are ultimately going to happen. There's no guesswork. There's no mistaking that God's will will come about. And he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, and he has spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. History is literally that, his story. And what do you think God's story is? His story is this, salvation. The only reason we are here on this earth is to know this God, and the only way to know this God is through salvation. And Lord knows that salvation could never be based upon you and me. You and I don't have enough good works in, in, our, in our lives to, to amount to what God n requires. All of us have fallen far short of that today. Amen? Can I just see a, a raise? Yeah, Lori at Walmart, there's several sins right there, right? Not just her going, but the things committed inside that maybe she didn't vocalize, right? She left, and I just said, Godspeed, woman. All right, maybe I'll see you tonight. But all of us are grateful deep down inside that it doesn't depend upon us, that God has always have a, had a plan, and the plan for you to be here tonight is exactly that, for you to know his plan for you, that salvation has always been a part of the equation. The second part is this. There's the purpose of salvation. Now, why would God chase men and women throughout history? If salvation is important, what is the purpose behind it all? To show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him in all our days. The reason you are here is to worship him. Every single man, woman, child born into this world has been designed with the ability to worship you. Here's the thing. We all worship something, but oftentimes our worship is misdirected and misguided. God has, has said, you are worshipers, but you're worshiping the wrong stuff. What are some of the things we worship? We worship sex. We worship careers. We worship sports teams. We worship stuff, fill in the blank. And the reason we find so much disruption in our lives is, be lives is because of this. When we worship something other than God, we feel the effects of it failing us. Do you feel we live in a culture where people are, are their idols are crumbling and they're failing them? How many of you have, have given up on government? Raise your hand. How many of you have given up on politicians? Raise your hand. How many of you give up on any sort of political party, Republican, Democrat, donkey, elephant, red, blue, all that stuff? How many of you are like, let's just start this over again? Because you're feeling the effects of our idols toppling. And God will continue to disrupt our lives and, and crush all the false gods. Because he is the one who is deserving of our service to walk with him in holiness and righteousness. The purpose of your salvation is for you to worship him and to no longer be misguided in your worship. Just, just today, you guys are going to think I'm a real weirdo, as if you don't already. I was reading about the Jedi church. The church of the Jedi. Did you guys know that there's such a thing? Matter of fact, there's not just one. There's actually several churches that follow the Jedi order of worship. Half a million members worldwide who have placed their hope in the theology of Lucas. George Lucas. Are we so desperate that we are afraid the Sith order is going to take over the world? And if only a Skywalker would arise among us and save us. Literally, ladies and gentlemen. But, but lest we laugh at them, let us stop and assess what we 
worship, who we worship. If it's not the one true God, you might as well worship at the Church of the Jedi. (laughs) So God is active throughout human history, pursuing hearts of men and women to save so that they would worship him. That's the purpose. Thirdly, they're going to be the pointer to salvation. So what Zechariah does right here, he actually looks down at his own child, and if you don't know, Zechariah's son will be John the Baptist. John the Baptist, Jesus said, is the greatest human being ever born among women. And why was he so important? Because he pointed people to Jesus. He says, and you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people (coughs) in the forgiveness of their sins. And may I suggest to you that there's just not one pointer to salvation, John the Baptist, but history is filled with men and women who would point people to Jesus. As a matter of fact, I'm doing that tonight. Michelle has done that tonight. Greg has done that tonight. The band has done that tonight. We're here to point you to someone greater, someone far superior, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. The world is eager to point you in all sorts of different directions. But who's really pointing you to Christ? Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Who speaks words of of eternal value and significance? So thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for allowing me to point you in the right direction. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. Because only in him do we have, notice that last phrase, the forgiveness of sins. The deepest need that we have is to be forgiven. Someone once said, it is man's deepest need, yet God's highest achievement. Jesus is the answer. And I love what C.S. Lewis said uh, as I lead into my last point, and that's this, the person of salvation. And guess who the person of salvation is? It's not Secret Santa, it's Jesus. (laughs) Full disclosure. C.S. Lewis um, had rejected God for so long in his life. And uh, if you're not familiar with the name C.S. Lewis, Time Magazine named him the greatest mind of the 20th century. He eventually came to know Jesus as Lord of Lords and King of Kings through a friend named J.R.R. Tolkien. You familiar with Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit? Well, Lewis and Tolkien would go on to write some of the best fiction that was based upon biblical allegory and history. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity just like I believe that the sun has risen, not because I see it, but by it I see everything else. Only in Christ do we make sense of this world. Only in Christ do we make sense of our lives. Only in Christ are we able to make sense of the things that we go through, the circumstances, the difficulties, the trials, the travails. Why? Because here's what the Bible calls Jesus. He calls him the risen sunrise. Notice that word. He has come to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise, if the sun did not rise, we would dwell in darkness. And how many of you wake up early enough for the sun rise? How many of you are grateful that the sun is in the sky? If we didn't have the sun, we would certainly be a miserable lot, wouldn't we? But yet the sunrise, capital S, shall visit us from on high. He has left his uh, eternal heavenly throne to dwell among us, to give light to those who sit in darkness, which is every single one of us, and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer to our lives, the answer to this world, the answer to our difficulties is Jesus. Because only he can shed the light, the truest light, because he is the light. And so may we never forget that it is the person of salvation, Jesus, who is our only hope. Help us, Jesus Christ, our only hope. You you get the connection there? Okay, I'm just tracking. Some of you nerd type, my wife laughed, which I'm really proud of. I love that. (laughs) I was listening to NPR radio the other day, and they had a story on, and I close with this. The story's title was this, the right to be forgotten. 
They said there was a day in which social media and digital media did not exist. Can anyone remember that far back? <laughs> and um, when you committed a crime or you did some sort of act that was documented, um, in order to go back, you had to go like to a library, dig up some microfiche, do some deep, deep investigation to find something, some sort of dirt on somebody you were studying. Well, today, guess what all you need to do is you need to Google. Type in someone's name. You ever type in your name on Google? And are you afraid, like, what's going to pop up? You ever curious? Like, some of you, see, there's some people in this world who actually have things that pop up on Google that they're not proud of. And so the story on NPR said that they actually have courts now that will choose whether they remove something from a social media platform or keep it on there. Can you imagine having done something in your life that you were not proud of and wishing you can go back and erase that off your record? Wishing you could just say, you know, if someone Googled my name, I wish that didn't pop up. Well, whether you did some sort of crime or whether you have something that would pop up on Google, we all know deep down in our hearts that there's stuff there we would never want anyone else to know about us. Can you just raise your hand with me? Is there something within each and every one of us that said, boy, if someone found out about me, I would be truly embarrassed. I'm truly shamed. I feel condemned. And here's the good news that this person of salvation, Jesus, already knows. And he still says to us, I love you. He already knows, and he says to us, I forgive you. And, and just so you know, forgiveness with God is not like the way we forgive people, because the way we forgive people is that we say we forgive them, but when they hurt us again, we pull that thing out we've forgiven them of and hold it against them. How many are masters at that? Raise your hand. No one's going to they're like. But God says to us, when I, when I say I forgive you, I deliberately will never hold that thing I've forgiven you again in your face and use it as a means to condemn you or shame you. The Bible says, as, east is from the, far as east is from the west, so far have I removed your sins from you. Corey Ten Boom said, and God throws him into the deepest part of the ocean and sticks a sign on the beach that says, no fishing allowed. I know this person. Many of you know the person of salvation, Jesus Christ. My prayer is that everyone would know the love, the forgiveness, the grace of Jesus. It's why we're here. So I will point you to him tonight. We're here on Sunday mornings if you want a place to worship. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to point until he comes to take us home. And at that day, when we are in eternity, I hope we're all there singing together and rejoicing because the person of salvation has been so good and gracious to us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand for this last song. He shall reign forevermore. And the promise of Christmas is this, that Christ wants to reign in our hearts forever. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for loving us, for giving this night all praise and honor goes to you.